Hey everybody, welcome back to Birds of a Feather Talk Together. Last week we talked about a bird that not many people have actually been able to see in the wild, which was amazing to learn about. But today we're going to talk about a bird that is very common in the U.S., the ring-billed gull. This is a bird that I've seen my whole life and kind of took for granted and didn't care about. Ever since recording this, though, we've been paying more attention after learning more and becoming fascinated with gulls. We recorded this episode a few weeks back, so you may hear John and Shannon talk about fall migration just getting started, but when this episode is released, it'll be in full effect. Be cool, everyone. That's okay. We jump right into a conversation about their trip out east, and you'll hear us get into talking about the ring-billed gull. Is this different from a seagull? What differentiates the ring-billed gull from other gulls? Go get your binoculars, and let's find out, people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're going to do outtakes someday, (laughs) and it's going to be embarrassing, isn't it? (laughs) Well, do you guys want to talk a little bit more about your trip out east and some birds that you saw out there? Is there any... You sent us that picture of the black skimmer Skimmer. that we thought was so cool. Yeah, I wanted to make sure you saw that just because it's such a fascinating bird. I mean, again, this is a... This part of New Jersey, southern New Jersey, on the southeast tip where Cape May is, is a mecca for for bird watchers to go in spring and fall migration. And it's this incredible place with in terms of shorebird migration. And, and, you know, I was just having fun walking the beach and picking out birds that actually that uh, were individually marked. Mm-hmm. So I found a couple of sanderlings where I could get pictures and, and they would have leg tags yeah. that I could send into the Fish and Wildlife and and uh, get them to look at the data set and and mm-hmm. see where they were from, um, you know. And it's just so it's just a it's just a fun place to bird. There are lots of ospreys and purple martins and like I said, you know, migration is just beginning to start fall migration. And uh-huh. so it's a time of year when when things are done breeding and starting to move around and so it's, it's just beautiful out there i'm transformed transfixed by other more mundane things i love the smell of ocean of ocean air uh, i like to i don't care if air conditioning's on i still have to have a window open there because i need that that smell and i love sanderlings and other little tiny shorebirds running back and forth up and down the beach following following the waves. I think they're absolutely adorable and it's they always make me smile and laugh. So, you know, <laughs> I know it sounds weird. I'm also love osprey nests, which you are pretty common. Um, and those are up on yeah, poles. On that, poles. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So anyways. And they're the sky is different there, just like I feel when I well, if you take the virus away <laughs> and I go home to British Columbia, there's a blue that the sky gets there that it never is here, even in the bluest of blue days in the winter when it's deadly cold. The sky is not the same, and the sky associated with the ocean is not the same as the sky here either. And so there's all these kind of meta things that I really like about going from one coast um, to the other coast. So I like hearing little kid voices on the beach. And our goddaughter, Grace, used to, <laughs> she used to follow uh, chase gulls on the beach. And um, she called them sea chickens. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that kind of is part of our family legacy now. It's sea chickens. These new words that <laughs> kind of get added. <laughs> Did you see ring-billed gulls out there? So, so you know, that's an interesting thing. I was going to say I saw one ring-billed gull. Yeah, okay. it's and not like it is They're here. not anywhere near as numerous. And, and what's what's there are these uh, birds called laughing gulls, which is one of the best common names out there because the sound of them literally sounds like somebody laughing. And they're just <laughs> – they're absolutely the most noticeable bird day in, day out. Uh, anywhere along. Yeah, well, they also the, the, are very habituated to people. They'll steal your sandwich on the beach. And <laughs> um, if you're not careful, like if you have a Dorito or something, chip up, it'll swoop down and <laughs> take it, no problem. <laughs> Why are gulls so, so like, bold? Like, they, it seems like they, more than any other bird, you have to look over your shoulder when you're at the beach. When That's you're... an interesting thing. I mean, you know, Shannon uh, often talks about this and, and, terms of different species having predilections to being more 
like that. And I think there's a lot we need to learn that we that we don't know. Um, gulls are part of the Shradria forms. So, so this is this big family of water birds that includes the plovers and the sandpipers and uh, um, the alcids and, and some other, a bunch of really weird small families. The, the skimmers are, are uh, another group in there. And uh, um, in some ways, they're kind of the most generalized group um, in terms of, you know, their bill morphology doesn't change very much across the different species. And uh, um but they're clearly really successful. So, so they're literally. I was thinking about this. Gulls are one of the most widespread groups of birds globally that you can imagine. So, they they're on the Antarctic Peninsula, and they're all the way up above the Antar the Arctic Circle, um, and the areas they're probably least common are actually around the equator. But there's still gulls around the equator. So you notice he's not saying seagulls, right? Yes. Because yes. <laughs> if you're standing downtown Chicago and you look up and you see a gull, you're not near the sea. <laughs> so we always call them gulls. One of my favorite intern stories, because I always tease people, they said they saw a seagull. And I'm like, where did you go today? <laughs> They're not here. And so one of the first sets of interns, they went to the beach after the intern season. And they sent me a text from the beach saying they just corrected someone who was sitting beside them on the beach, <laughs> telling them they're not seagulls, they're just gulls. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you learned something. How fantastic. <laughs> my scolding is not for nothing. <laughs> I, would, I would say ring-billed gulls in, aren't necessarily as aggressive as I think the laughing gulls are. Okay. But at the same oh, time, they can be pretty aggressive. On, yeah, if you're sitting on the beach in Chicago, the ring-billed gulls are not shy. No, they're not. No, they're that not, shy. and they're they're certainly ubiquitous. <laughs> so it's a ring-billed gull is an a, an incredible story because it's a it's a North American species, and it's found all the way across North America. But if you look at this, and I still find this hard to believe, the historical accounts suggest that that they were eaten. The, not the birds themselves, but the the eggs, for instance, were raided by uh, settlers as they moved westward, and that the population actually declined dramatically back in the 1840s, and was still a fairly uncommon bird into the early 1900s. Their plumages were used for women's apparel, hats, and things like that as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. but they just they exploded after the Migratory Bird Act was passed, mm -hmm. and. I think that corresponds actually with the development of all these cities along across the entire Midwest, a lot of which were near water. And so as long as they can find colonies and set their colonies up, they can live near people. Okay. And their feathers actually change color during breeding and non-breeding season. Is that correct? N not or, not really. Not I mean, really? So, so they do get some... some Dusky stuff around the head okay. um, in the non-breeding season, but in general, they, you know, they have this gray back. The adults do. Um, the young, it takes it takes them two years to to reach adult plumage, and so they go through a set of plumage changes. Gulls are a the birders have an absolute fascination with uh, identifying gulls, in part because in a place like Chicago, for instance, there are a lot of rare species which could show up, and so understand and a lot of those can be juveniles and so understanding gull plumage is, is something of a science where there are some amazing experts that have done very detailed assessments of every single species and how they change over the course of the cycles that it takes the annual periods to reach adult plumage. I think it's a real it's a very serious challenge for bird watchers gulls like gull identification so mm -hmm. that it's almost like a game that they they put so much effort, people put so much effort into kind of going to the edges of the distribution of identification. So, uh, so I find it really fascinating. The amount of work that's been done on that compared to other birds, pretty common that we know very little about, but all of a sudden, you know, almost every individual gull has been sketched or, or photographed. <laughs> so 
So are ring billed gulls kind of the the most um, widespread in North America? That's kind of when people picture a gull. Is it the ring billed gull usually? If you're not not for me no. from the Pacific Northwest. Okay, <laughs> wouldn't well, be. Well, I think that's an interesting thing. If you were if you were near the coast, it would be one of the other species like herring gull or yeah. western gull or okay. or, or Those something are the like things that come great black back gull is yeah. another really distinct one. But but inland, what you're seeing almost all the time, not all the time. I mean, it's, so for instance, herring gulls have gotten commoner in the in the Chicago area, but but by far, they're, they're ringbill gulls outnumber them by far, and uh, and and again, it, it's a it's a bird that has done very well around humans. I think they're very adaptable. Um, one of their primary Food items probably across Chicago is actually earthworms or uh, rats. I, yeah, they may probably eat a few rats, but they're not a lot. I mean, they're they're, I think they're they might eat more rats than cats do. Well, that might be true. Do they they hunt rats? Like they'll take it up. And, sure. Wow. They're. I mean, if you're going to be in a garbage dump, no offense, gulls, but that's where they always are, right? Or where they usually are. You're going to eat all kinds of. All but, kinds of stuff, you know, I, I earthworms mean, maybe, but I think they've adapted to eat a lot of things that are, whether that's garbage um, from the dumps or taking food out of bins on the sides of the, uh, of the sides of the road. So, I mean, that's one thing. If you're going to be close to humans, and if you're going to stay that way, you're going to adapt to the things that humans provide you, mm-hmm. and that. But you can also see them, you know, so, so you can be driving around the highway around here and you can see a big flock of them out in a, in a fallow field. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing about the earthworm aspect, as I, 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 you'll see them along Grant Park, for instance, in downtown Chicago some days, and, and there, there'll be a hundred of them, and they'll all be spaced about a meter apart, just kind of working along the grass, and they're, they're, Picking up earthworms, or sometimes I think there's some other species of, of uh, flies or beetles that are burrowing in the grass to, and then emerging, and they'll 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 forage on those. So they're very opportunistic in terms of what they'll they'll eat, and that's one of the secrets to their success is is they can exist in a lot of different habitats across all of Central North America because of that. Does their diet affect the way, like, I mean, if they're or in garbage dumps eating trash versus the ones that are eating earthworms, I mean, that can't be good for you to... I don't think we know, and that's a that's an yeah. interesting thing. And and, and I'm, I'm, the garbage dump thing, is, well, actually, all of this is interesting because one of the things they are willing to do is fly long distances from their breeding areas. So a lot of the breeding colonies are in places along Lake Michigan here in, in, in Chicago, and uh, the birds are making daily treks probably 12 to 15 miles sometimes inland to either to a dump or to other sites where they're, where they're finding food. But they and have really strong site fidelity to where they were born. So they, so they may go all over the place, but when it's time to breed, they come back very close to wherever they were, wherever they were born. Mm-hmm. So which is, I find that interesting too, yeah. whether that's a certain beach or a certain rooftop. Mm-hmm. Um, which is gotten them in trouble in a lot yes, of ways. So, so, so there's, I mean, they're considered a pest and the government has gone in in various places because they're worried around the colonies of, for instance, uh, bacterial levels in Lake Michigan, such that they've actually gone out and done what's called oiling, which is they'll spray oil on the eggs so the eggs won't hatch. Oh, oh my gosh. And they've, they, it's a crazy thing to me because I don't really think it's necessarily... Uh, affected the Ringbill gull population no, when it, it comes has. right down to it, a little bit. I mean, there was a, the city of Chicago commissioned a report in 2007, and I looked at it last night because it had some things in it that I either forgot or didn't know. And they the oiling of eggs it has been very successful in lowering the density of birds in Chicago. So, so what I wanted to know in that, so, I wanted to know whether – what they don't say in that is whether it actually lowers the bacterial counts. Mm. It does. Mm. <laughs> Changing <laughs> where, so they've kind of tried to get rid of certain colonies, um, and it has changed the fecal bacteria. So the question I always asked Wait, when I first. Wait, did you say seagull? 
Did she I said fe- fecal. I said fecal. <laughs> fecal. I thought you said seagull. Oh, sorry, I got it on my mind. <laughs> Rhymes with. But yes. they actually, I, I always used to say, you're blaming the gulls. I mean, come on. There's a lot of people bacteria. Yeah. spewing bacteria all over the yeah. place. So right. they actually commissioned a, a study where they looked at the bacteria that were in the that were in ring-billed gulls and then did actual genetic sequencing of the bacteria from the beaches. And so I was, they, it's clear that the gulls are putting the bacteria on the beaches that are closing the beaches sometimes. So when they change where the uh, birds are nesting, it has changed the incidence of bacteria causing beach closures. Oh, so okay. it's been successful in that in that sense so that's a good thing it's i I guess even though the idea of oiling it's distasteful i suppose but um there are a lot and they go and find other places to nest Mm -hmm. so they flew drones over chicago and they in 2007 and they found four giant colonies that they didn't know about so technology enables the city to know more about where these birds are and then how they're going to um, control where they where they go and where they poop. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm convinced that Amazon is actually very good for uh, ring-billed gulls because it creates large roof space um, (laughs) that is potential nesting sites. (laughs) Uh, And it's it's amazing. Uh, Yeah, we've had calls uh, from people. in situations where they're nesting on a rooftop and it gets really hot in the summer and a bunch of they'll sometimes they'll just be a panic in the colony um, possibly from the temperatures and they've jumped off the sides and and there's been a mortality event where we'll get calls and and, and yeah it's like a lot of dead babies on the below the building but at the same time I think it's a if you think about it it's a safe place from Predators like raccoons and and which may be the the biggest danger to well outside of humans with oil guns and because again <laughs> yeah. they're a protected species if they're nesting on the Amazon roof and Amazon wants to go out and do something well they're not doing it during the nesting season because they're protected mm-hmm. so so yeah. have humans kind of led to their expansion like for is sure. it, I mean it's it's all if if we didn't have all this trash for them to eat and roofs for them to be on <laughs> their population would be kind of I it's, mean they experienced a population so, decline because of DDT mm-hmm. oh. and again being in cities is a you know people don't shoot you if you're in on, they shoot people but they don't shoot birds right. in cities mm-hmm. right. for the right. most part so being in a city is relatively safe from so from th- that perspective. The vast majority of earthworms they're eating are introduced. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, 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 it's kind of a, it's, it's a huh. fascinating situation. Yeah, and, and it's like whack-a-mole. Like everything we do is <laughs> the gulls are going to go here. They... Right. Well, there's all these unintended consequences, you know. I just think it's an impressive thing about the, you know, a native bird just adapting to a changing landscape in a in a really amazing way and so it's not the same story as starlings and pigeons and uh, house sparrows you know th- these birds have been here for probably several million years and they're still here and they're figuring out a landscape that's you know they've gone through uh ice ages where there was ice all over this area and they would have had to have been further south and then they've expanded back north into it before, well before humans got here and now humans are changing this landscape and they're still here doing possibly better than they ever have before. Wow. <laughs> so what's your instinctive response to uh, to rain-built gulls? Do you have a positive or you have a negative? Or what do you... I, I think it's a positive. I think that they're resilient. I'm impressed that like they can find food anywhere. It kind of seems like like I feel like the uh, when we talked about the great horned owl, it was so impressive that they could hunt anything. And with the ring billed gull, I kind of have the feeling that they can find food anywhere. It's not necessarily that they're a hunter, obviously, but they're gonna get food from here. And if it's not here, they'll get it from there, and they'll get it from the water, and they'll get it from the shore. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. That was, that was kind of my feeling. Yeah, Amanda. and I feel like when I 
I feel like when we see them at Rosewood Beach and Highland Park, I like I feel like last time we were there, we saw one eating some Cheetos or something, like from <laughs> someone's beach blanket. But like uh, I always feel like when you see, we've talked about this with the Canada goose. If you see one, like if I see one goal, I'm like, oh, it's so pretty. Like what a majestic bird but then when you see like a bunch you're like oh gross <laughs> <laughs> so i i think my impression is just you know like when i see one it's really attractive <laughs> <laughs> even if it's eating cheetos or whatever but uh when there's a bunch of them then i'm like grossed out especially now that i've learned all about their the fecal bacteria <laughs> trust me <laughs> change your enjoyment of life in general it's amazing to see a place you know so, so they're migratory too oh, so right. so even though they're you can go out in the coldest day in chicago and you'll still see ring gulls around a good proportion of the population is actually moving south and as you were saying that i was like thinking about a time where we were down in a place called lake carlisle which is this big lake in in south central illinois and it was minus 20 with the wind chill and there were literally several hundred thousand ring gulls hanging around there wow. spending the winter but not me <laughs> I was inside with my heating pad, no doubt. <laughs> Five blankets, bemoaning the fact that I live here in that time of year. <laughs> so how I do can't. both of you feel about ring gulls? What are your thoughts on them? General take. Well, I studied um, gulls and terns for my master's thesis, and so I have a different take on them because they're difficult to skin, they're fat, and when you shoot them, they get bloody. So there's a lot of work. Okay. Be, so I, I might be, I might have a different perspective than most people do. Yeah, I think they're remarkably flexible and clearly fascinating because of how difficult they are to identify for mm. for bird watchers. And I like that. I like that they're so challenging. I think that's an interesting aspect of them. And there's some really beautiful, um, really beautiful gulls and turns to just... specifically related to ring bills is is I like watching them move around and so for instance in the evening in South Evanston I can go out and sit on our front porch and watch them come in from the wherever they've been out west and I've had upwards of 300 individuals go over in a single evening in these little groups as, as they're coming in. And you're just thinking, like, wow, what a life to be able to literally sleep along the lake and then <laughs> fly out to whatever dump you're going to go to or, or <laughs> field and stuff and, and then fly back. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it almost feels like, like Howard Street sometimes is literally like they're using that as a marker to get themselves to the right part of the lake that they want to be at to spend the evening. It's not so fun to be pooped on by ring-billed gulls. <laughs> happened to me at the museum, actually. <laughs> Good thing we have showers, and I have an extra set of clothing in my office. But Wait, how did that happen? Were you, were you outside or inside? <laughs> I was outside with our son, and uh -huh. I can't even remember. I had to do something that day in the museum, like give a tour to somebody, and uh, this gull pooped on my... <laughs> head as we were going inside of the museum yeah that, it's supposed to be good luck right that's what i've heard what yeah. in whose definition <laughs> not mine I, i've always heard that too <laughs> is it really yeah, is it good luck yeah. to get pooped on by any bird or just a gull i think any, any, any bird, bird yeah i think yeah. that's interesting that, oh, that i didn't know that either and, and yet i like that <laughs> Maybe you two have been pooped on too many times. <laughs> I never, I did not know that. I didn't feel blessed by that. No. Let's just say. <laughs> but so yeah, I have a lot of admiration for them, even though they shouldn't steal my Cheetos on the beach. <laughs> I do not approve of that. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're getting close on time. Um, should we do a mailbag question? Sure. sure. Okay. All right, so this is from uh, one of our listeners, Kathy from Skokie, our friend that uh, wrote a few weeks back about the murder in her backyard. <laughs> so she has another question for us. Kathy is saying, um, I'm enjoying your podcast very much. It has reinvigorated my interest in birds. Pre-marriage and children, I used to travel the world to see various wildlife. I visited the Peruvian Amazon, 
the Okavango Delta, the Galapagos, Hawaii, Alaska, and many national parks in this country. I was never a species counter, but no, my count is over 500. Now, 25 years later, I'm an empty nester, no pun intended, and would like to get back to experiencing birds and other wildlife in their natural habitats. Any suggestions? The pandemic made me love house sparrows. They're my friends. I listen to them all the time, and I feed them, which is weird. That's my backyard. And I think bird watching is thought of as um, a solo thing often, but there are lots of great groups of people that go bird watching, as you guys know. And I would join an Audubon Society or a local bird watching group and s- explore the social aspects of of being outside with other people, um, especially in retirement, you might not be spending as much time with other people. Um, take advantage of all of the apps. You may not be working anymore, but the data you can gather can help preserve birds if that's what you want to do. And you can become as obsessed with making your daily lists that John is, have a nervous breakdown if you realize you forgot to put a list in or you missed doing a list. I, I, I forgot to submit the list from yesterday that, See? that I did this morning. <laughs> yes. I mean, turn it into a social endeavor. Get involved with the apps that teach you more things that you know. Field guides are great, but you can't carry field guides all over the place get to appreciate your local birds and then you know go further go on bird tours or natural history based tours this josh angle that john was talking about he has a company called red hill birding and they have a wide variety of experiences that you can do locally and internationally with birds and you'll meet people on those trips that will become lifelong uh, friends I, so I think that's really, you know, it's not just anymore. It's not just like a little old lady bird watching kind of thing. Bird watching is social, could be competitive if that's what you, if, if that's what you want to make it. Um, and you can kind of go anywhere and do it. So if you, pe- if you have somewhere you want to go visit, you can research there, find out what birds are there, and find like a bird tour too if you don't want to do it on your own. Absolutely. So I, feel yeah. like, I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, you guys are starting out. Would, would you go on a tours or are there any places you've went? Yeah, we've talked about like planning trips and I think also like um, we went to a a wedding in California in March. It was in northern northern California and we went on a horseback ride on it at a dude ranch and we were asking the wranglers like all these questions about the birds we were saying and, and they had no idea <laughs> about yeah. it, and we were so frustrated. And we said, like, someday we're going to go work at a ranch and be, like, the bird people. But, yeah, I feel like that's um, – I totally – when we haven't vacationed a lot <laughs> since March, um, but that's something we – are definitely looking at is yeah. bird tourism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think there are so many different, like, tour groups out there in areas where there are a lot of birds that you can go to. So, I mean, even just signing up and joining one of those and finding a local that can show you, yeah, you know, what's absolutely. out there. Yeah, mm. So So you can always look for local guides anywhere in the world and pretty much find them these days. Yeah. And, and you know, the no web is an amazing thing. she does outside, it'll positively impact her mental and physical health. There's... If you were living, leading data-driven lives, there's very good data that being outside um, helps. It lowers depression in people. So just go outside. Even yeah. if all you do is sit in your yard and listen to the sounds that are in your yard or watch whatever, that those encounters are very positive for people's yeah. mental and physical health. I wanted to so. comment on what you said, Shannon, about it being social because like, I feel like RJ and I, like, we love, you know, it's just the two of us. We don't have kids. And we like being in situations where we're with people, but there doesn't have to be, like, a ton of interaction. And, like, bird watching is perfect for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you're in a group. It's kind of like It's listening. not like sitting beside someone on a plane. Exactly. Right. Yeah. You can talk to someone if you want. You, maybe yeah. you don't want to talk at all. It, it's, it's like a communal shared experience, yes. but you can also kind of make it your own. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You can, and it can be as social as you want, but it's, you know, 
it's fun to be around people um, like that. I feel like it's a good – I never thought of it as social before we joined our club, and now I think it's like – I mean, that's not you know. what you people think of when they think about bird watchers, and that's why there's very – it's a very male, especially at y- younger ages. So this boy dominated most of the bird watching, the young bird watching community is boys, and so that's. I hope that changes, mm-hmm. uh, because it it is a social activity, and for you know middle school aged girls, social activities are really important, and if all they see is a lone boy bird watcher like John was, <laughs> maybe going out with some older guy who loves to bird watch as well. And they form these really remarkable relationships that are very important. But if girls behave differently, and they do, it has to be seen as more of a social endeavor for them. And and that requires there being a lot of girls mm-hmm. in these in these communities so that you can find your social community in the context of bird watching. Mm-hmm. I think and one of the greatest things about it, and I mean, you guys have experienced this, so you could talk about it, but I, I think the the other thing is all the technology and, and online uh, tools that you can bring to bear on some of this lowers the barrier to success and actually enjoying it in a way that I think allows even individuals who don't have a social network yet to get a foothold and and get into it. And yeah, because there's there's a the bird birding community can be pretty critical and snobby and uh, and that prohibits people from joining mm-hmm. because they're afraid to make a mistake because, you know, the stakes are so low that people have to be so mean. It's like you know, get over yourselves. <laughs> yes. But but there's a large part of that that causes people who are really interested in birds to not call themselves a birder because there's somehow there's some quality metric associated with that. And I don't like that gatekeeping. And I think birding is too gatekeeping, mm-hmm. in my opinion. And, and birds are everywhere. Mm-hmm. They're open to anyone. Yeah. And if you make a mistake, you shouldn't be felt, you shouldn't be you know, expelled from the community because you can't, because you call it a seagull or because you can't identify a ring-billed gull. Uh, And the apps really do, I think, give people just maybe a little bit of confidence that they can be around other people that they don't know and still be able to participate in that. But I think it would be a good good idea down the road to, to get somebody like Josh Engel in here to kind of talk about tour leading because that's another, you know, Shannon's right. You can find tours out there that are geared for all levels of experience with birds. So my father, before he died, had seen over 8,000 of the 10,800 species of birds in the world. And in order to do that, he was going all over the world to very remote places to see small numbers of birds that were um, that he could still that he hadn't seen somewhere else already. Wow. And in order to do that, he was generally going with a whole bunch of other really hardcore listers just like him. And you know, I, I look at the evolution of that. And when we were growing up, my brother and I would go with my dad bird watching, and it was just the three of us. And my dad never took a bird tour till he was well into his 60s or so and realized that he could take his pastime as as the question, you know, the person was saying that they're an empty nester to a new level. And so he did. And, you know, that's not for everybody. But someone like Josh could actually put a lot of that in perspective. And, and so we should we should definitely yeah. see if we can. So Josh, yeah. we met Josh as a middle school student person when we first got here. That's how long we've known mm-hmm. Josh. You know. So to see his evolution as a bird watcher from Evanston to is pretty fantastic. He worked for John for many years. He went on lots of expeditions, did DNA work and then decided to start his own tour company. And I would a hundred percent tell people to go anywhere with Josh because he is kind and considerate and he knows how to treat people well on these tours, and he has good people working for him. So. And what's his tour company called again, just for the listeners? Red Hill Birding. 
Okay, Red Hill Birding. Yeah, and that's a that's a local Chicago based company. Very cool. But they're going all over the world. And, and they have local tours they too. Have local, so. They have local and they have national tours. And so I, that's another thing is is you can get as adventurous as you feel comfortable with. And so, you know, that might be going to Cape May, New Jersey because you don't want anything more adventurous than that, or it could be going to Bhutan. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, the one thing that birds can do is also is, you know, I watched my mom get more physically disabled, and it made me look, and then I lost hearing in one ear, which has made me physically unstable. And the idea of making accessible trails, I think, is really important. And birds can be found anywhere, so you can be on an accessible trail where it's easier, safer to walk, and birds are still everywhere. You know, you don't have to climb a mountain um, to look at birds. You don't have to be the most physically fit person to look at birds. Mm -hmm. And I think we in the U.S. need to make more physically accessible spaces uh, for people so that they can experience nature outdoors in a way that their physical um, limitations make hard. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to to call it for today. Um, unless anybody else, did you have something you wanted to add, John? No. My message yeah. for the day is, they aren't seagulls. <laughs> <laughs>